Welcome, everyone. I am so happy to see all of your faces. Thank you for all your patience. This is my first time around. Uh, Paul Santiago has really big shoes to fill. Uh, but all of you guys have been amazing with your patience and your creativity. I think the program looks amazing and I'm really excited. So welcome, have a wonderful time if you need anything. Just know that we're here, we want you to have a good time, so we want to resolve anything that you need to resolve. Have a good time. Good morning, everyone! Great to be here on this joyous occasion today. My name is Gerald Jones. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Pandemic of New York. I'm also the chair of Brittany Bellamy Associate at night. Yeah! And I'm also one of the vocal user user leaders. Yeah! I just want to take this time out to thank everybody that's here. One of the things that we're happy about is the Peer Network of New York. With the love and the dedication of everybody here, we have been successful. We have been moving on up. <laughs> one of the things they told me is that it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah, that's right. We peer up as a child. And you are the village. Uh -oh. For everything that we have done out there in the field on our work, on a daily basis, we got to be jobs. I just want to take this time to really say thank you very much and that we will be extending our hands out and we're hoping that when we extend our hands out, somebody grab the door. So what I want to do now, I'm going to take it too much time. I want to introduce our first speaker, which is Nad, the um, co-chair for the Harm Reduction Coalition. Thank you. 
monthly group of lifelong learners who promotes the field of harm reduction through education, advocacy, and community engagement. Um, and you'll see us walking around in these blue shirts and come talk to us. We'd love to meet people. Agencies and took a really strong leadership role at the National Association of State 
alcohol and drug abuse directors, and put out some amazing policies. One of the really things that I use all the time was Massachusetts passed its own version of health care reform several years ago. And what did we learn from that? It helped so many people. The people that were still falling through the cracks were people with substance use issues when they were trying to get health care, when they were trying to get treatment. And that's a lesson for all of us, because what we're about is making sure that drug users don't fall through the cracks. That's right. So I want to offer that you're not just here to give me my marching orders. You're here to give Michael his marching orders, because he's open for business. We have a drug czar. So obviously one of those things, but the, those people are ineffectual at getting things done. Now, if you're like looking and reading the newspapers, you're wondering, is the federal government getting anything done? Is Congress getting anything done? What we've seen from our work in federal policy is that it's like an iceberg, right? Only the tip of it is visible, but there's all kinds of things happening below the surface. And we're here to help stimulate and spark that and support that. Now, Michael made a choice when he accepted my invitation to speak at our opening session. Right. right? Because we know that harm reduction is still political, right. and it still gets politicized. Michael is the acting director of ONDCP right now. The president has nominated him to become the permanent director, and the Senate has to have a hearing and confirm him. Now, people who might be more politically cautious would say, this is not the time for me to get in front of a room of drug users and harm reduction advocates <laughs> and open my heart. <laughs> Michael said, sign me up. When is it? Where is it? I can't wait to go. And this office is really good about it.
including saving lives. They are helping us find new ways to move the drug reform agenda together. I want to talk a little bit more about the Office of National Drug Control Policy, or ONDCP, and what we have done during the Obama administration regarding drug policy, and identify opportunities for working together in the future. There are three issues that I want to discuss today. Sentencing reform, prescription drug abuse prevention, including overdose prevention, and medication-assisted treatment. ONDCP is mandated by statute to publish the President's National Drug Control Strategy, which lays out the administration's approach to drug policy along action items worked out in coordination with our federal partners. In 2010, the inaugural strategy included a chapter devoted to breaking the cycle of drug use, crime, and incarceration. When I was in Massachusetts, I remember the words of former Director Kurlikowski basically saying that we cannot and uh, will not arrest and incarcerate our way out of this problem. The Department of Justice is responsible for one of our greatest achievements to date, a completed item to reduce sentencing disparities, disparities between crack and powder cocaine. Despite scientific evidence that crack and powder cocaine cause similar physical, psychological, and social effects, the U.S. Sentencing Commission had a long-standing rule in place that provided much stiffer penalties for crack cocaine sales. I've seen this impact of the rule firsthand. A few weeks ago, in celebration of recovery, I invited several folks in recovery to come to the White House. One of those guests was a man named Michael Baynard. Michael was born into a rough neighborhood in Compton, California. He was a bright teenager, and his mom did her best, but the circumstances he was born into prevailed, and he got mixed up with a gang in high school. He dropped out, he developed a substance use disorder involving crack cocaine, and found himself homeless, alone, and in despair. In 1996, he was arrested and convicted for possession of less than a gram of crack. Under California's three strikes law, he was sentenced to 25 years. <laughs> In prison, he stopped using drugs and spent his time appealing his sentence. In 2002, six years after his conviction, his appeal went to a U.S. District Court where a judge named Spencer Letts, after carefully reviewing his case for two and a half years, overturned the sentence and freed my family. Since his release, Michael has spent his time mentoring others in recovery and working to prevent teens and Compton from joining gangs or using drugs. He earned his GED and is now enrolled in college and working full time. Michael's story proves that behind a rap sheet, there is a real person, often struggling with a substance use disorder, who needs treatment more than he needs a jail cell. As you know, the crack and powder cocaine sentencing disparity dis disproportionately affects people of color. Admittedly, these reforms have not completely eliminated these disparities, and there is more we can do in this area and more we must do. Over the next two years, this administration will continue to focus on reducing disproportionality in our criminal justice system, diverting people away from arrest and incarceration, and reducing the consequences of having a criminal record. In our, after our inaugural strategy, it became apparent that abuse of prescription drugs Specifically, opioid analgesics was a serious issue that needed focused coordination and federal action. In 2010 alone, more than 38,000 Americans died from drug overdoses and drug-related deaths, and they outnumbered motor vehicle fatalities. Just over 22,000 of those overdose deaths involved prescription medications, and most of those deaths, almost 17,000, involved prescription opioids like Oxycontin. These are not illegal drugs. They are available by prescription through a regulated industry. New data from a study of insurance enrollees suggests that the rate of overdose deaths increases dramatically as the rate of opioid use increases. To address the problem of non-medical use and overdose, the administration in 2011 released its Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Plan, which had the twin goals of reducing non-medical use and reducing negative medical consequences, including overdose, by 15% by 2015. The plan was meant to be an extension of our overall strategy, which calls for increased access to treatment, including medication-assisted treatment, 
and expanded availability of naloxone. The prescription drug abuse plan uh, contains four pillars. Sorry, you know, I'm not good at working the slides and talking at the same time. So you'll have to read along. Given our former director's background in law, as Daniel talked about, we were also uniquely situated to work on access to naloxone for first responders. Law enforcement and first responder naloxone programs are particularly important because law enforcement agencies are in rural, suburban, and urban areas, and so is the overdose problem. So naloxone programs, combined with good Samaritan laws, are making a difference. The Boston area has been hard hit by the opioid epidemic, as many parts of this country have, and police departments there are, have moved quickly to get naloxone into officers' hands. In February, ONBCP and Senator Ed Martin held a roundtable at a fire department in Taunton, Massachusetts. The room was packed with city council members, nearby mayors, and parents of children who had overdosed. In the middle of the discussion, a call rang out over the intercom. First responders were being dispatched to the scene of a possible overdose just a few streets away. The law enforcement community in that region has stepped up to meet the challenge, and it all started in Quincy, Massachusetts, where more than 300 lives have been saved by first responders with the loss. You know, I, I know I represent the nation, but you know, I see some of my friends here from Massachusetts who were really instrumental in getting that work done. So great to be Since that time, the law enforcement agencies across the country have begun to carry naloxone, and more and more states have enacted overdose prevention and good Samaritan laws across this country. Overdose oh, on uh, our federal partners have also magnified our efforts. In June, the Veterans Health Administration recommended overdose education and naloxone distribution as part of medical care to at-risk veterans and they have an interim policy for naloxone distribution. Their mail order pharmacies now carry naloxone, and this week the VA reported it already had nine reported reversals. Wow. And it doesn't stop there. In July, Attorney General Holder and I convened a day-long conference on law enforcement and naloxone and issued an announcement of urging federal law enforcement agencies to explore equipping staff with naloxone. In August, President Obama announced an executive action on military and veterans, which included Department of Defense law enforcement employees carrying naloxone. While opioid overdose is rare in active duty military, the DOD saw this as an opportunity for a federal agency to lead by doing the right thing in publicizing this life-saving tool. We have also been working to promote co-prescription of naloxone. SAMHSA and colleagues at the Boston Medical Center have partnered with us on webinars to, on the overdose prevention for physicians with the American Psychiatric Association and the American College of Emergency Physicians. We have evidence to suggest that our activities are beginning to make a difference. In 2012, for the first time in over a decade, overdoses involving prescription opioids decreased from the previous year. At the same time, unfortunately, and as all of you know, heroin overdoses are clearly on the rise. While data suggests that only a small percentage of those who misuse prescription drugs transition to heroin, we know that four-fifths of new newer heroin users began by misusing prescription pain medication. This tells us that we need to continue our efforts on focusing, preventing the non-medical use of prescription pain medication, enhance our intervention efforts, and enhance better access and more timely access to treatment. Chronic prescription drug abuse and heroin use we know are intertwined, but it demonstrates that we must ensure that treatment is available, and particularly medication-assisted treatment is recognized as the standard of care for opioid addiction. <laughs> Individuals in need of this medication for their substance use disorder should not be denied such treatment. According to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, See, I'm not good at flipping my stuff. <laughs> According to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, we have a major treatment gap in this country. It is important that we work to make it 
make evidence-based treatment available with the same sense of urgency that we feel for increasing access to naloxone. We are committed to improving treatment access because we know that for many people with serious substance use disorders, medication-assisted treatment is crucial. It can mean the difference between homelessness and a substance use disorder, or full-time employment and recovery. It can mean the difference between hope or despair, between life or death. I had a truly serendipitous moment one morning this summer. This is a true story. I was running early for a round table with some of the leaders in the substance use disorder field. And we were meeting to strategize and hear ideas about what more the federal government can do and to, re to reduce the magnitude of the opioid problem. Had a few minutes to kill, so as usual, I tucked into a nearby Starbucks to grab coffee. As I walked in, a woman introduced herself to me. It was her first week on the job. Her first job since entering the recovery. Her story started like so many. She was prescribed powerful opioid painkillers after surgery. Grew dependent and could not afford the price of prescription medications on the street and began by injecting heroin. Her daughter was in college at the University of Maryland, but she found herself living on the streets. When she was committed to getting better, two things made recovery possible. Supportive housing and access to people who can We also know that naloxone won't take everyone. Some people will use alone, some people will be found. Mm -hmm. We cannot assume that naloxone is enough when many people who might have been, effect, uh, been benefited from treatment fail to get it, perhaps because of a wait list, lack of insurance, or fear and shame. Amen. We are pleased that Dr. Dr. Joshua Sharfstein will be here uh, at this meeting. A paper he recently published showed that expanding access to methadone and buprenorphine saves lives. Simply put, people maintained on medication-assisted treatment don't die. This tells us if we identify and treat folks before they transition to heroin, that we will reach our harm reduction goals. But we cannot expect people to treat themselves or diagnose themselves, and we must make treatment available. We are currently reviewing opportunities to leverage federal grant and contracting dollars to ensure government-funded medication-assisted treatment is provided to those who need it. Finally, I want to just mention that since the beginning of this administration, our office has been involved in ensuring access to other means to improve the health of people involved with opioids who began injecting. Despite the congressional ban on federal funds for needle exchange, we recognize that syringe services programs as part of a comprehensive public health effort to reduce injection, uh, to reduce infectious diseases from injection drug use and to help get injection drug users into treatment and eventual recovery. 36 states plus the District of Columbia currently have syringe exchange programs. We are working with our federal partners to implement the Viral Hepatitis Action Plan. It is particularly important, it is particularly important to ensure that drug users in treatment are not categorically denied access to new cures for hepatitis C. We are also working with the Office of National AIDS Policy to reduce new infections uh, among people who uh, are injecting drugs, increasing the number of people who know their status and ensure those who have HIV are referred, engaged, and retained in care. Finally, I want to share a quote with you from President Obama. A few weeks ago, he said, we live in cynical times, and Washington needs that cynicism. But I always tell people, cynicism, cynicism never cured a disease. Cynicism never built a business. Cynicism is a choice, but hope is a better choice. As a person in recovery, I've learned that patience is essential. We must meet people with where they are and help more people on the path to better help. We have a lot to do, and we can and must and will do better. But we should all have faith. We have tools 
We have naloxone. We have treatment. We know what works. But most of all, I think I know what's coming next. <laughs> we have each other. That's right. Together, we can work toward the same mutual goals to reduce the consequences of drug use, to prevent overdose deaths, to help people live safer and healthier lives. Thank you, everybody, for the work that you do, and let's get to work. Ladies and gentlemen, as you heard, let's get to work. My name is Hiawatha College. I am the senior chair of the Peer Network of New York. I am a board member for Vocal New York. And I am the harm structure specialist at an agency called Community Access. And I have the song with me today to basically give an honor mm. to our fallen harm reduction warriors that came before us. Yeah. Yeah. Who made it possible for many of us, for us to be here and made it possible for many of us to be able to do the work that we do. Oh, amen. So basically, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask for a moment of silence and respect for those fallen harm reduction warriors that came before us and made it possible for us to be here at this 10th by the annual International Harm Reduction Conference. Moment of silence, please. Michael Jordan. Thank you. 
a great friend, and I have so much to thank him for. Um, he still drives a large part of my motivation, and I have not gone a day without thinking about him at some point. And I know that's true for many of you out there today. Um, I still have to expect him to walk in at any moment or catch him stealing candid shots of the van from the health department window. <laughs> he always wanted that perfect shot. But, uh, one of the last things we actually talked about was the perfect picture of syringe exchange. Um, he said that it couldn't be of buckets, dope, or rigs, but of the relationship between outreach staff and clients and programs and communities. Yeah. Yeah. And the exact words were hands into a sunset. Um, he felt strongly that we held communities together behind the scenes, that it was our job to keep mothers from losing their children to preventable disease and harm. Um, the work that you guys are doing today, overdose prevention, decriminalization, and beyond, he is more than proud of you, I know he is. Um, missing him is still not easy, and I'm really not sure that it ever will be, but um, they are great memories, and I really look forward to making more with all of you, and really um, his legacy and what he has left behind can really never be erased. All of his memory will live on for all of us and uh, as long as we remember that and look together. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, Baltimore. My name is Tanisha Jones. I would like to say to all of the folks who came to the 10th Annual Biannual Harm Reduction Conference here in Baltimore, I am a peer educator at night. I am also a member of the Peer Network of New York and a local leader. Yeah. Yeah. I do sex workers outreach, PDSE, and SEP. That's right. Yeah. Our next speaker and special guest, Julie Stamper.